I'm going to talk about um, why I think retrofitting MVHR into really quite a lot of our buildings is um, sort of necessary and uh, highly desirable. Um, and the kind of in view of really the twin problems that we're facing, um, an indoor air quality crisis, which uh, has uh, been really brought to the fore with COVID, but um, I think it's been it's been a, a long long time standing. I mean, these are just lung diseases, all of which are made worse by poor indoor air quality, and um, and a lot of diseases are probably caused by poor indoor air quality. And then there's heart disease as well, and cancer, and um, skin disease, and and as we now know, infections. So it's um, it's something that we really not got right in this country up until now in our homes and as we're finding out with the COVID rates in schools at the moment definitely not in our schools either and this is something that um, Stephen Holgate um, who works has worked with the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal College of Pediatricians has done a couple of really good reports on the health impacts of poor indoor air quality on them um, children and all of us and also poor um, outdoor air quality which is which is linked but um, the children's one we're looking focused particularly on on indoor and he's really pretty angry about the injustice and there was an interesting paper actually recently which I haven't got on a slide from them um, uh, Sunny Dimitrilopoulou who's on the I think she's in the Tapas network uh, who's written about all the many forces that um, make indoor air quality worse um, where for people with disadvantage we've also got a climate crisis as we know so we've got to retrofit our homes and we've got to um, insulate as much of the floors and walls and roofs and put in double glazing and of course it's often shorthand called leaky our homes very leaky in the UK so this starts to get people worried <gasps> If you make the homes all airtight, what's going to happen to the air inside? And then this, you so often see there's a tension between air quality and um, uh, energy efficiency. And oh no, if we stop up all the drafts, then you know the buildings, people will suffocate, and you'll be living in a hermetically sealed plastic bag and stuff. Um, and sadly, I mean this this one. I don't know if you can see my mouse, no, probably not. This one here was last week. Was a an architecture lecturer saying, oh, we shouldn't be so obsessive about their tightness. Well, yeah, if we want to get good ventilation, we can put great big holes in the buildings. This is uh, the olden days, chimneys in particular, drawing massive amounts of air through and through the building and windows open and stuff. But um, we can't afford that with the climate. So what we get instead is a horrible fudge where the Buildings are kind of airtight because we need to save energy, but they're kind of ventilated because we still need to ventilate. Um, so you've got a kind of airtightness of maybe five or seven um, air changes per hour at 50 pascals. And you've got some pathetic little extract bands and some trickle vents that are not closed. It's even, it's in. In part F, they even assume that part of the air coming into the house comes through the leaky fabric, which is quite an assumption, really, because, um, yeah, there will be some air coming in, but where? <laughs> That's what I think of that. So this is some um, research actually from New Zealand, but all it's showing is these houses are in order of air tightness, from the leakiest to the most airtight, and then in the grey bands and the yellow bars are showing the um, amount of um, air exchange and as you can see there's no correlation at all and even when you've got a leaky building with um, uh, with high air exchange this is some excellent research from a woman called Jessica Few at, at UCL who might be interesting to to uh, get on in her own right um, they had a very leaky house, 15 air changes, well, sorry, cubic metres per square metre, I do beg your pardon, I'm not very, not very technical always, 
Um, so a leaky house and it had not a bad air exchange rate overall, but she tested individual rooms by looking at um, carbon dioxide decay. And in the living room of the house, when they closed the living room door, obviously they didn't have the 0.5 or 0.4 air changes an hour you need for good indoor air quality, nothing like. And she took her smoke pen around the house and, um, and the air was cold, air was mostly coming in under the stairs in this case, although it's often um, where the pipes come in, in the back of the kitchen cupboards or it might be the leaky back door but it wasn't ventilating the living spaces, the leaky fabric at all. It was just ventilating the staircase. And of course, then you've got the, the purpose provided ventilation, the uh, trickle vents. Um, this is uh, 80 homes, uh, not particularly um, airtight, but with so perfectly um, standard trickle vent ventilation and intermittent extract. And as you can see, most of them hardly had any, less than 20%. I think overall about a third of the, um, of the vents were open. So that was some um, research published by the government. This is some older research and this is um, uh, the three, um, well, one of them is vents and the other three are fans. And this is somebody who went into homes to, again to measure the air quality and they found the red bars are all fans that are turned off. You know, somebody climbed on a chair and pulled out the isolator because the fan was noisy probably or they were worried about bills or something. That's Ian Mordit's research. Um, and if people want to want links to any of this research afterwards, just, you know, ask in the chat or um, ask Helen to ask me. Okay, so. Uh, leaky buildings don't give you the fresh air you need, so we might as well make them airtight, mightn't we? That grey patch is the air is the energy we'll save going from leaky 10 air changes, which is the sort of legal um, leakiestness, um, and it disappears pretty much if you go to passive house airtightness. So let's not be frightened of airtightness. Uh, this graph, the light green, also shows you the difference between um, not having MVHR, so that light green in the Part L 2025 is still permissible for the future, marvellous. But if we went to uh, airtight and MVHR, um, we get those tiny little green stripes of energy lost, heat energy lost. So basically, if we're going to meet our climate goals, we need to make buildings airtight and we need ventilation with heat recovery and even the regs recognize that if we go as airtight as we need to for the climate we actually have to put in whole house ventilation i'm not going to talk about whole house extracting ventilation mainly because i don't really know much about it but you could get peter rickaby and erigo to come and talk about that um okay so whole house ventilation a lot better in my view i've got it myself um, it's quiet because it's a great, it's a big purpose built, high quality unit in an ins sound insulated box. And all the air goes in and out of ducts. Um, so you can't actually hear it in the rooms because it's a long way from the fan. And because you can't hear it, you're not going to turn it off. Heat recovery saves energy. The air supply is nice and warm. So you don't think, ooh. Um, and also when it's really, really hot outside, your heat recovery can preserve the cool inside the house, which is actually rather wonderful, um, especially when you're working from home and it's boiling. Um, you can have it and you don't, we don't have air conditioning, but we have, you know, we have the overnight cool is kept in by the MVHR. So that's nice too. And you can leave the windows shut. If you live near a busy road or um, you hate your neighbours because they're always smoking on the front doorstep. You can keep all the windows closed and you'll still get all the fresh air you need. And with MVHR, it comes in through filters as well. So it doesn't, filters won't cut out all the air pollution because obviously some of it is um, a gas like um, nitrogen dioxide, but uh, particulates get reduced by the filters. And you can also put the intake like around the back or somewhere where the, um, if you're doing a, a larger building or flats or something, you know, you might have a courtyard and you might want to draw the air from there. Some people don't have barbecues down there. Anyway, so does it work in practice? Yes, 
seems to be. I mean, these are this is about some um, eight years ago, I think these buildings were built. The red ones are the bedroom CO2 in houses with MBHR. The blue ones are bedroom CO2 in um, bedrooms with other ventilation systems. And as you can see, the really high ones, the sort of 4,000, 3,000 and 4,000 CO2 in the bedroom was all <clears throat> non-MBHR. Uh, and the MBHRs are all clustered around the kind of 1,000 mark, which is more what you'd want in a bedroom really. In schools, yeah, you can get the teachers to open the windows, but we've been telling them for about a year, or CAP has certainly, and um, well, to be fair, this was before COVID, it might be a bit better now, but Alan will tell us whether it really is. This is MBHR in schools versus non-MBHR in schools, and it's a bit of a complicated slide to read, but the grey uh, lines are an old 1970s school. The green lines are a naturally ventilated but quite modern school, but they made a lot of effort with the ventilation. And then the orange and blue lines are, um, they're both passive house schools, so they've both got MBHR. Now, why they're all on top of each other is they're all quite near each other. So they're all having the same kind of weather. Um, and each sort of grey band is, is a day, a school day when there are people present. Um, so you can see the um, at the time the regulation said schools had to keep below 1500. The passive house schools were managing it. The orange one was close to 1500 because the ventilation was specifically set to achieve that. The uh, blue ones, they were actually, I think they set it at 1000 and they achieved it. And no amount of opening the windows and cowls and this and that was really making the grade even with the, the um, naturally ventilated nice school and as for the old 70s one well you can see this it's a dreadful 5,000 parts per million carbon dioxide that's not good um, how am I doing for time Helen uh, another five minutes you're okay yep okay a few minutes. <laughs> right so um, people in people in fuel poverty tend to be people with poor indoor air quality. There's all kinds of reasons. I mentioned at the beginning of interesting paper recently, um, looks at the kind of structural and looks a lot at the buildings that people in, uh, in various kinds of disadvantage live. There's also just factors to do with your life. Um, you're likely to be more people in a smaller space. You're more likely to either smoke yourself or have a smoker in the house. Laundry drying is really difficult because you probably haven't got a garden and you won't want to run a tumble dryer even if you could afford one because you know how expensive they are. So you just drape the laundry around the house. Um, and you might well need more because you do a manual job and your clothes get sweaty and dirty or maybe someone in the house has got a disability and then perhaps they've got incontinence or um, they need lots of skin treatments all sorts so more laundry the building fabric's likely to be poorer um, and so you're more prone to condensation and mold and then um, you're probably going to be using fragrances because for all the reasons above your house might not smell very fresh and you're cold you're cold so you're going to close off the ventilation we just well i'll just go no no well anyway we're going to you're going to close off the ventilation because we're very good at telling a cold draft we're mammals we've got no fur either so you know we we really don't like the cold but we can't tell carbon dioxide and moisture in the air really so this is what happens this is people with all those factors on the left hand end in their lives are not ventilating and they're getting COVID and they're dying and it's just disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful really and we know what to do about it but um, we haven't done anything about it yet. Okay so I mean this generally that's what I'm trying to say if you're in fuel poverty really hard to have good indoor air quality. Right so this is what can be done, these are social homes in Lambeth they were retrofitted to Enerfit, so they're warm, but they've also got MBHR. This is what people said about it. Their health or their children's health improved dramatically. Uh, the, the quote at the bottom actually is somebody from another Enerfit retrofit 
who's actually um, her own health has improved. So it just it makes a, such a dramatic difference to people's lives. And at the same time, their bills go down because of the energy saving. So I think it's worth doing. It's not straightforward to do, practically speaking. This is a rather nifty system they do in, um, in the Netherlands. That whole porch on that blue house has actually got an MVHR system and a heat pump in it. Um, and it's kind of bolted onto the outside along with the insulation. So that's one way of doing it. But you can also, you know, more normally, you just end up um, uh, finding somewhere to put the unit, which is about the size of a gas boiler. Um, and then you have to run the ducts through the house. It's not always straightforward, but often it's done just by putting them behind um, suspended ceilings. Um, and then you can sort of pop the ducts out over the doors. Occasionally you need to core drill through a bit of masonry. Um, but retrofit is an infrastructure project. And if we're retrofitting for energy, then we should be retrofitting for ventilation as well. Otherwise, we won't get half the benefit. There's a risk of making people's health worse, which would be just a crappy thing to do. And, um, and we're just losing all the advantage. If you put in proper ventilation, you can make the buildings airtight and you get the maximum energy saving um, and you can get the maximum health benefit. Um, we don't do retrofit like that at the moment. Uh, this is this is from about 10 years ago, but it's BRE Wales, a guy called Colin King, um, finding retrofits, uh, wall insulations done in houses that didn't have ventilation systems and no one had checked, no one thought to improve it. And of course the, the infiltration of the walls went. So yeah, I love these guys, Colin King and Peter Rickaby. They worked and worked and worked. They lobbied bays. They kept sending bays examples of terrible installations. It's kind of improving. It's finally supposed to be in the regulations of a publicly funded retrofit that you do check the ventilation. And Peter Rickaby's written some good standards, but they're still not paying for it. So yeah, there's a way to go. Right, so that's me. Um, do ask me questions. And we've also got an MBHR in our own house. So I'm happy to talk about that as well. Uh, but I think if I hand to Alan, because I think some of the questions might be for both, would that make sense? I don't know, you're, yeah, you're in I, I think so. Thank you ever so much, Kate, for that really, really good sort of overview of thinking through the, the complexities of MVHR. So yeah, I think we'll go straight to Alan and then we'll take questions for both at the end. I think mean, that'd make a lot of sense. Okay, can you see my screen? Is that working? Oh, I've got something yeah. on it, haven't oh, I? I've got something, that's it, that's it, yep. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about a fairly sort of practical application of retrofit of mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. This is just going to focus on a particular project which is in progress this year. Um, this is schools in the uh, London borough of Lewisham and working with RAFT retrofit action for tomorrow. Now RAFT is uh, led by Harry Paticus there on the left, um, he's an architect, passionate about low carbon retrofit, um, but he's also um, really focused on the, the children in the schools and um, yeah, the whole experience. So he's um, been going into schools to talk about what um, a low carbon school means and, and so on, rather than just sort of roll out a uh, top down sort of um, retrofit plan from the expert. So it's, it's been really sort of inspiring work that he's doing. Now, um, oops, Kate mentioned um, funding. Funding for um, ventilation I don't think is readily available. Um, so RAFT has been looking at sort of whole school um, retrofit energy carbon saving packages for SALEX funding, which has got sort of criterion on um, how many pounds you have to spend per ton of carbon dioxide saved. So we've worked, um, ventilation doesn't seem to much save much energy despite the heat recovery aspect of it. When we've done detailed energy audits of the buildings, what you actually find is that 
they aren't being ventilated as well as specified or as expected. So actually, there's not that much heat loss through ventilation. The ventilation is just really bad. Um, and um, so we've got a combination of insulating the schools, making them more airtight and including MVHR heat recovery ventilation. This gets us to a low heat load, at which point we can heat with a air source heat pump using the existing radiator system. The heat pump is now half the capacity it would have needed to be. So we've got a, a relatively sensible capital cost for the whole thing. Um, and then the combination of switching to heat pump heating and halving the heat load delivers carbon savings that are able to fund the whole project, even though the MVHR isn't really sort of meeting the um, energy saving criterion on its own. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk a bit more detail now about these three schools in Lewisham here in South East London. It's interesting to see into the history of the schools. The one at the top there is Dalmain School, built in 1927, more or less as a whole, around two courtyards, um, been modified since then, which I'll talk about a bit more later. Dalmain School is the oldest one, but I think um, we're looking here in the pitch for a the main block built around 1928 and we've actually looked at retrofit just to the 1970s block on the left and then the last one here is Mayak Garden built in 1971 so that's 50 years old today and it um, reminds me of the school I went to as well classic 70s now early 20th century schools when they started to be um, sort of purpose-built buildings had a lot of thought put into the environmental aspects of the design um, this is not one of our schools here, but it's a good drawing that um, illustrates what we've got um, on the south here. Very large windows for lots of daylight. Um, it's quite likely that the only artificial light would have been gas. So you really want to use daylight here. The north side has got clear story windows at high level. And if you can see on the, I don't know if you can make out on the section here, there's a covered veranda to the north. That's here on the plan. So this is open circulation area. Um, so classrooms have got doors straight to outside. They've got windows north and south, and um, they're pretty much guaranteed to be able to have good levels of ventilation. Um, some schools at this in the 20s were actually going to open air schools as well. There was, I think there must have been a um, kickback from a global pandemic around the beginning of the 20th century, and definitely a, a keen in, interest in, in ventilation. We're going to look a bit more at Downbury first. So this is the... Uh, um, original plan as we've got it when it was built with um, boys one side, girls the other. It's all changed now, but these two courtyards still exist. However, this is this is a veranda, open veranda. So, um, and you can see here this picture I found from the 1950s of this school shows um, sort of classic school windows, a lot of windows open, a lot of these um, center pivot windows. Um, I know they're quite hard to make airtight, but they're very effective at ventilation as it comes in and out through the same space. Um, and this is a, a view of the south side, still lots of glazing. You can see here, just check all the windows open as it should be. Um, and now this is what it looks like at the moment. We've got a veranda is fully enclosed with PVC double glazing. Um, this doesn't open except for the odd door. Um, the clear story windows also all replaced with sealed units. Um, this is the view from the inside. You can see that would have been doors and windows. All these would have been open to outside when it was built. They're now all either to the closed corridor or sealed up. Now, ironically, they've replaced that covered veranda on the south with this um, plastic thing here, which is also um, reported as hampering the ventilation, particularly in summer. It's a bit of a hot house. We've now got new PVC windows. These are, are top hung, don't open so far. Um, so yeah, so we'll see how it's going. So just to, how can we tell? We're using CO2 monitoring, which is a, I think probably a pretty well understood approach here, um, just um, working out what the sort of um, ventilation we're getting in from the CO2. Um, ideally in schools we'd be aiming for below a thousand parts per million now with, with COVID, um, 
ideally below 800 parts per million. Um, and given this is relative to an outside of 400, this is probably about a 50% increase in ventilation rate over the standard we've been generally working to of a 1,000 parts per million. So we put some monitoring in um, already with the natural ventilation. And you can see here, um, this is through a school day. I understand they had the windows open in the morning and it was 1,500 to 2,000 parts per million. And then maybe not so many open in the afternoon as they're up to 2,500 parts per million. Um, so this is definitely, despite windows all over the place, it's not um, actually that well ventilated at all. So the plan here is heat recovery ventilation. In this building, we're looking at using self-contained units in each classroom. So these get fixed to the ceiling here. They need a direct connection to outside and then they supply air through these um, grills here and the air returns back to the unit. Um, they're quite bulky with low speed fans so that they don't um, make too much noise. And inside is the heat recovery unit. So they you know, supply air at about, with about um, only 20% heat loss. And that's the, the plan. I mean, this is the installation of today is, is in progress at the moment. Back when we first looked at the timetable for these seminars, it looked like it would be finished by half term, but there's um, been a lot of supply issues and uh, contractors having something else better to do, it seems, a lot of the time. Um, yeah, so this looked like a nice, easy drop in classroom ventilation will fit all classrooms solution. Um, this illustrates some of the problems we've had. One of the classrooms, we had a nice route for the outside ducts through here, a clear story window, which no longer really worked glare wise with the teaching arrangement. But then putting the unit on the ceiling, we'd get the air blown and it would hit this beam and that would direct cold air down, or drafts rather, down to the uh, children below. So this is needing to be modified with um, a slightly sort of dropped ceiling there to make the beam disappear into the ceiling. Now this, but other than that, the approach here seems to be quite good. However, I'll just talk about some other, the other two schools where in neither of those cases, we could actually use the same um, ventilation approach. We've got two different ventilation approaches for the two schools. So this is Dalmain School. Um, this is a view of the 1970s block. This is a masonry cavity um, construction. Um, and um, the general plan also is to carry out cavity wall insulation. And, but once the scaffolding went up, um, we found that actually, despite um, condition survey saying the roof was fine, no one had actually been to look at it and it was leaking into the cavity. So there's gonna be a slightly more complicated retrofit involving re-roofing, but that will mean insulating the roof as well. Um, now, you can see there there's new PVC windows, quite good quality, low U value actually. Um, and some spandrel panels have been introduced to reduce the amount of summer overheating as well. Inside, these first floor classrooms have got um, sloping ceilings and this one's got a very low ceiling height at the external perimeter. So this turned out to not be um, suitable for the um, ceiling mounted one solution fits all approach. So we've gone for a, in this one, a different approach. But first of all, we've looked at the monitoring to see how things are going. Um, again, not too well. Um, one of the classrooms there, the middle classroom has regularly been up to 5,000 parts per million. Um, I'm afraid that's with the windows open as well. The staff are doing what they're supposed to. Um, but we've got here single sided ventilation with windows that don't open very far. Um, now, just had a look at the estimate when the classes are open. The uh, central one can achieve about half an air change per hour on window, and the side ones have got a bit of cross vent and a bit more opening, and they can get over one air change per hour. Also, interestingly, we um, decided to see if we could estimate what the um, air tightness was, looking at decay curves. Um, now with these schools, we wanted to do blower door tests, but there's bits of asbestos 
lying around. This is an old um, sanitary waste incinerator with an asbestos chimney, lovely. So that's generally we're not doing any sort of pressurization or depressurization in case that disturbs asbestos. Um, the construction of this building, 1970s is concrete in situ slabs, ground and first floor aerated. That is um, lightweight concrete blocks with a wet plaster and a cavity wall, brick outer skin. And we've got these new PVC windows for actually reasonable quality. So looking at the uh, decay curves, um, I've looked at quite a few nights once things have all settled down and um, we're pretty happy that the windows are shut when we worked out the actual infiltration in the classrooms is about 0.02 to 0.03 air changes per hour. So although other bits of the school may have shown up more leakage around say um, toilet stacks and um, that kind of thing, entrance doors, the classrooms are looking at an air tightness of around at um, 50 pascals, less than one air change per hour it seems. So incredibly airtight, um, even though, and actually it's interesting looking at the presentation. Those are the details that Kate had there that um, the 1970s schools had the uh, lowest um, ventilation rates there. I think the masonry construction was quite inherently quite airtight. So the approach here is a central air handling unit, which is going in this loft space. The central air handling unit is still in Sweden, I believe, so that's not helping us show you any finished pictures today. Um, the ductwork is kind of big, uh, making use of the high spaces. Um, there is actually a redundant existing ventilation system, and you can see here that was the grill they did have about 100 mil square. I don't know if anyone's done any sums on how much ventilation you need for a, a classroom of 30 quids, kids, but that wasn't really up to the job. Um, yeah, so this is this is one approach and it kind of replicates what we've seen in, in new passive house schools quite often. Um, but in a lot of cases, these size ducts, which are three or 400 millimeters diameter, just are not gonna fit in the, um, in the space available. So an example of that is the final school I'm going to talk about, which is Myatt Garden. Um, a few more pictures here. So this is a two story block we're working on. Again, it's got an in situ concrete slab um, for the first floor, lovely thermal bridge there. There's a sort of ring beam all the way around. Um, downstairs, there's a sort of good collection of downstand beams. They tend to run the full length of this block with various cross walls as well. And underneath that is 2.2 meters. So that's um, really quite low. And then there's the exposed concrete soffit of the floor slab above that. On the first floor, we've got this um, roof void. This is, a, I think, a conservation area or listed feature. So this has recently been replaced um, from the original lovely asbestos in um, insulated steel panels and as they form the insulation line, they are also brought to form the air tightness line, but actually it turns out to be reasonably well daylit up there. You can see daylight at the end. So at the moment, the first floor had been kind of ventilated accidentally through the roof space, but um, one of the aims of the energy retrofit is to seal that up. But on the first floor, there is some room in this um, rather wonky roof space to get some duct work. However, the downstairs with these downstairs beams has given us a lot of um, going around in circles trying to find any solution that will actually work. Um, so here's a, here's a plan of the end of the end of the building. Also you can see these classrooms are all weird shapes. There's no corridors, there's no sort of anywhere to put services and numbers here say so that's 43 square meters, that one's 44, that one's 41 square meters. So these are 30 children classrooms. There's no space to take um, floor area away for any sort of services. Um, we looked at displacement ventilation as an option so that we wouldn't have to run stuff around the ceiling, but um, couldn't find anywhere that was um, more than two meters away from a, a child's seating place. So there wasn't anywhere to put that either. And ended up with a MVHR unit for every classroom. Um, this is kind of and then duct work on the ground floor has got to sort of snake its way between the beams. 
occasionally has to go underneath one. Um, and these have all got quite tidy external connections, often through windows here. And um, this is how it's going. Um, so you can see we contractors have done quite a nice job of keeping that low. This is somewhere it was unavoidable that it had to get under this beam to get to an MVHR. And these units here are the sort of largest possible variant of a basically a domestic size unit. So these will provide 600 meters cubed per hour. And they're now getting enclosed in um, acoustic cabinets because they are often inside the classroom space, basically. Just, um, and here we've also got um, ones that have got an element of humidity recovery with quite high ventilation rates in classrooms. You can get low humidity. Um, and actually it kind of makes life easier because now we don't collect condensate with these MVHRs, whereas with a conventional heat recovery element, when the outside air is um, colder than the inside dew point, you start to collect some condensation, which needs to be drained somewhere. So we've kind of avoided the headache of trying to drain that condensate out. And then in cold conditions, that condensate can freeze as well. So we've avoided the risk of that. So hopefully that's going to make things simpler here. Um, those two are both actually the first floor installation. You can see the ducts are going up through ceiling tiles. And on the first floor, the installation is, is pretty discreet. An extract grill hit there on the left and a supply terminal there. There's quite a number of supply terminals around. Um, external connections are, some of them are hidden in the soffit on the first floor. And then there's these um, combined terminals for the ground floor, either through a bit of wall or through a um, upper window panel. So these exhaust air out directly and pull air in sideways through a sort of segregated terminal to avoid short circuiting. Um, yeah, so this is actually due to be up and running end of next week, but still I haven't actually got any um, finished data for you. So that's that's next, I'm afraid. Um, so we'll be carrying on the air quality monitoring, um, though past experience with MVHR shows that provided it actually operates, um, we should kind of get what we expect. Um, but still, we have to see that in reality, compare with existing and then see what the feedback is from staff and pupils. And that's it for me for now. That's great. Thank you, Alan. And uh, if I stop sharing. Yes, if you stop sharing, that's great. Fascinating complexity in there. <laughs> it's, um, and I actually, I hope you will come back in a year's time and tell us the results of some of these. It would be great to see. Um, so thank you to both Kate and Alan for two really interesting presentations there, I think to really get us thinking about um, the complexities of uh, mechanical ventilation heat recovery, but also the benefits and potential to do this if we can think it through properly. Um, I'm going to open up to questions now. So uh, there's a couple appeared in the chat already, uh, but um, if people have got any others, please stick them in there. So I've, I've first of all got uh, a question for Alan, which is, have you been able to link any of your data with studies on things like uh, students' concentration levels and indoor air quality um, in schools? Um, no, I've seen research a couple of studies which were fairly sort of well controlled of carbon dioxide levels and various cognitive performance. I don't know if other people have also seen those papers. I think there's only a couple of them, probably was it University of Berkeley, America? Because um, it's quite hard to separate out the different aspects of ventilation. So they actually, um, I think, had some. Um, means of bleeding CO2 secretly into the um, environment and then carrying out standardized cognitive studies. So that's interesting. And no one actually knows why um, carbon dioxide affects us this way. I don't think anyone does. If anyone does, let me know. Um, interesting to know that it does, but, um, and it's also therefore gives, does give us some guidance of what sort of ventilation rates we want. And um, also, yeah, air quality relating to, to viruses is uh, something we've heard plenty about, not least from Kath here. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think we'd be interested to get the uh, staff and pupil reactions from your systems and to see yeah. what they f how they feel it changes their air quality or their concentration or everything. That'd be really interesting to see when that gets to that stage. Yeah, um, I, mean, I know. Yeah, go on. I know concentration can depend on other things and feelings of stuffiness are associated with temperatures as well and other yeah. other things. But we'll see if it can make any yeah. subjective differences. It might be also interesting about noise as well, because external noise for some children is a big distraction. Um, whereas at least although there is some noise with MVHR, it's 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 low level background as opposed to you've got noise from outdoors through open windows. Yeah, I mean major issue at Dalmain at the moment is the kids are getting distracted by the, the builders on the scaffold actually <laughs> so yes they're definitely they're learning. distracted they're learning something from um, I'm going to put the next question to Kate which says how, how do we how do you think we can get householders or landlords to maintain their MVHR systems properly if they're not maintaining the heat loss and the air quality will be worse than intended and Jenny says she can send a summary of recent research to anyone who's interested. So what, what can we do to ensure maintenance of MVHR is taken seriously? Well, uh, hi Jenny. <laughs> um, I think basically we have to recognise that it's as important to health as, um, as properly maintained gas systems and anything else. And that an MVHR should have a service contract the same way you're gas boiler does. I mean, ultimately for an individual householder, it's going to be the individual householder's responsibility, but you know, they should, it should come with that advice and that facility. Um, and for landlords, um, I mean, there are, one of the most useful things that landlords can do, if you remember that blue house I showed you, it had the MBHI unit actually outside the house. And then this is an ongoing headache for landlords trying to get gas boilers serviced. Or, or the gas boiler servicing contractor actually getting into the house to get to the gas boiler if the MVHR is outside and the landlord has a key you know it's in a locked little shed um, then the landlord can just have their contractor go around and change the filters and check the fan speeds or whatever every six months um, the same way that they're trying and failing to do for gas boilers at the moment I mean the main problem is that we ha just haven't taken it as seriously as it is serious and um you know you see that in retrofit policy you see that in um the way that we've responded to covid uh, you see it in the building regulations and i mean i think all we can do is just keep banging on about it really um you know take a leaf out of colin king and peter rickery's book they just lobbied and lobbied and lobbied at bays and finally ventilation started to get taken seriously in retrofit policy but we've got to do the same everywhere i mean that's how i think it should work but it's political in a way. Yeah, thank you. Any any thoughts from yourself, Alan, as somebody who's done the more on the site practical bits? Um, yeah, we've had some designs where we have put the MPHRs in a porch, which was accessible by the uh, um, maintenance staff. Um, and been looking at designs for flats, which are the really hard one to do because you're trying to. Um, keep the MVHR accessible from a, a circulation space, but also in the fire compartment of the flat to avoid you know, risk of breaking fire compartments. And um, so that's kind of things in design at the moment yet to be built. Excellent, thank you. Um, there's a question in here from Bernard, which is to Alan, did you ever consider detecting, locating, quantifying air leaks using ultrasonic technology? For example, in the case where it's not an option to do um, pressure uh, blower door tests because of asbestos. Um, not in this case. I think we've looked at that. I think it, I believe it only sort of identifies very sort of straight uh, air paths, say around a, a window unit or something like that. Um, it was interesting then going to the carbon dioxide decay levels. So we'll try and look at those on the, on the other schools if you can find good enough data as well which does sort of give you an idea that actual in situ ventilation in the classrooms as opposed to I mean I know from that those classrooms that look very airtight we've also seen the uh, likely leakage around the soil pipes and the, the risers from the, the toilets and that kind of thing so if you did a blower door test you'd probably get a, a leakier building but that's 
not ventilating the classrooms, which is one of those key things that, that New Zealand research from um, Cara showed. That what it was, yeah. And actually, I've got another question as well for you, Alan, about the, um, I know you've been doing CO2 monitoring as part of these studies and, and environmental monitoring. Can you just say a bit about your experience of doing that and what, you know, what, how you perhaps went about it? Was it low, um, sort of small numbers of sensors or were they connected together sensors? Okay, yeah, the system here is doing a combination of air quality monitoring and um, moisture and temperature monitoring. So it's, it's using a OmniSense system. Um, so there's um, a lot of building fabric work as well, um, often having to make good things that have been falling apart for the last 50 years. So it me can measure um, humidity and moisture content levels. This is a wireless system. And then there's a, a hub that is having to be connected back into the internet. That means we can get access to the uh, um, data remotely. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, I think that's that always helps. I think if you've got that remote access into mm. the data, um, um, I know we've we've found that we've got lots of loggers which are not remote access, and that's a bit more of a pain. <laughs> it's obviously more expensive. Yes, I've got some remote, some USB data loggers in a number of flats, and um, particularly with COVID, we've been only able to see the data about every year. Um, Whereas this is this is great. This is the AECB, I think, um, got started up a connection with the OmniSense system. It's interesting for sort of looking at internal insulation and things like that. If we get onto that with these the schools, and that's where Harry's used it on um, other residential projects. So, I mean, I've got a, perhaps a question to both of you as well, which is the um, obviously there's been a lot of focus on building energy net zero recently heat pumps have been a, are a, a big thing um what are your sort of thoughts on um where mvhr should fit into this picture uh, and you know actually should we be trying to do something much more holistic than just jumping into yet another single technology to to, to do something i don't know whether kate you want to go first or <laughs> Yeah, um, I think, I mean, in a way, I think the, the analysis of what's needed needs to be holistic and it needs to be occupant centred. I think we've, we've looked at carbon separately from we've looked at people in the buildings and that's just wrong. I mean, you know, we could all just go and live in, live in a tent. That'd be very low carbon, but it wouldn't be very good and wouldn't be very popular. So I think we did need to put the person in the center the occupants in the center make sure they're warm and make sure that and they affordably warm and make sure that they've got good air quality and that they're not going to be made uncomfortable by their ventilation and then you design around the people the way you, the best way you can in the most inexpensive and easily practically fittable and lowest energy and i think it's more important to get energy than carbon actually because uh, you can get into silly trickery with offsetting emissions. But what you need to do is minimise energy and then, you know, then the renewable energy that we've got room to build the turbines is, is enough to go around. So, so we analyse it holistically and then it, in some places it may be possible to do, you know, to plug in something that, for example, does the heat and the ventilation, but the actual solutions um, from a practical point of view are going to vary with the building. So that that um, uh, blue porch thing has an MVHI unit in and a heat pump, I believe. Um, I could be wrong because it's in the Netherlands. I don't know in detail, but um, sometimes you can actually combine the two, but in a larger building, you, you just it just makes more sense to separate them. But what has to be holistic is the, is the analysis and the policy, and the policy still isn't holistic. They're still seen separately, part F and part L, you know, basically pulling in opposite directions because part F really doesn't understand how, A, how to ventilate properly, and B, how to save energy. So it's, that's where the, that's where the all round look needs to come. Did you want to say anything, Alan? Um, 
yeah, I suppose on the particular of um, retrofitting heat pumps, there's a technical um, hitch or aspect in that um, heat pumps work efficiently with um, low heat emitter temperatures. Um, most of our buildings have already got radiator systems designed for higher temperatures from gas boilers. Um, it's really neat if you can just reduce your peak heat load so that you don't actually need such um, high temperature emitters and then can just um, plug a heat pump into an existing emitter system. It's not always going to be possible, but what we found from these schools is that they've been designed sort of properly for two or three air changes per hour through the windows for classroom ventilation. So they actually tend to have quite sizable radiator systems. Um, and if we kept the natural ventilation, you know, we'd like to think that they achieve that level of ventilation. They don't actually appear to be in practice, but you kind of wouldn't feel happy about designing a heat pump system that relied on people sealing the windows up and not having any ventilation. However, getting rid of that big element of peak heat load by um, being able to close the windows and um, ventilate with minimal heat loss has then meant we can go straight to a heat pump solution which is a lot lower capacity and can work with existing heating systems and that applies in, in houses as well that people really feel the cold and the worst examples of heat pumps failing to really live up to their promise has been in, in windy weather in leaky houses yeah i've got one final question which um because kate said to ask you so i'm going to ask you <laughs> about your own experience because i know you have retrofitted MVHR into your own house uh, and it's an older property um, and I just wonder whether one or both of you might give just a, some experience of, of that process. I don't know um, there's two bits of isn't there there's the uh, actually trying to do it um, and then there's the experience of living with it um, yeah it's, um... overall beneficial <laughs> Overall beneficial, yes. Um, yeah, I wouldn't um, move into another house and not put MVHR in for sure. Um, yeah, seems very strange <laughs> idea. Um, but it's still, yeah, we have got um, exposed ducts running up the the landing at the moment because um, there was nowhere else to put them. We could sort of put some plasterboard around them, I guess. It's all a bit um, fun and it involved drilling some very holes through some very thick stone walls so hiring diamond core cutters and things um it's not as um cost effective or cheap as putting it designing it into a new building that's for, for sure so it took him um, two of us i don't know three or four days probably to to get everything in but we wouldn't be without it i mean it's just transformed the house really that with i mean we insulated it and replaced the placed the windows kind of at the same time but we, in fact, we insulated and replaced windows before we uh, uh, connected the MVHR. And we did have some mould and damp issues, just like in those pictures. Not as bad as those, but, you know, it was noticeable. And we thought, oops, yeah, you know, this house was, we had rattly old sash windows and doors and holes in where the rats had eaten the bottom of the door. And it was really quite a state. And so we smartened it up. And, uh, and then we really needed the ventilation. And what's so great about it really is that you can't hear it. You can shut all the windows. Um, and um, we know when the neighbors have a bonfire or whatever, you can even turn it off. You can close the windows, turn off the ventilation for an hour and not have to breathe in the neighbor's smoke. Um, and, uh, and just knowing that we've got fresh air coming into all the rooms and, you know, with COVID, it's quite a big house. And with the two of us working from home, we're not, worried but we've got adult children and of course they come home having been to nightclubs and gigs and goodness knows what they're bringing with them so you know we can turn off the ventilation when the kids come to visit and uh, you know it's just it's just fantastic to have low humidity in what was otherwise a damp house um, and uh, yeah I can't you know it, it's just brilliant it was definitely worth the kind of week of upheaval and mess and dust that's great, thank you. And I, it's really interesting that you mentioned about the humidity that you, it's not just the ventilation here, it's solved, it's a humidity problem too. So I think 
I'm going to say thank you very much to both Kate and Alan for two really interesting talks and, and I think exploring some of those the real complexities of doing this in practice and I think that's something that many of us are less aware of and we forget about we 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 will happily advocate for a solution and then forget that actually real buildings are really complicated they were never I, in fact some of those schools I'd be saying knock them down and start again <laughs> but um you know that's not going to happen we have to live with what we've got in many cases and it's great to see that the way you're thinking through those the the how to make something work but how you can't just have a simple one-size-fits-all solution so thank you very much to both of you for two really nice talks and a, a really interesting session um just to say to everybody else we um our next seminar will be on the 16th of november uh we're expecting to have justine railt from aether limited who's going to talk about uh uh, she, she's uh, working around international missions associated with inventory projects uh, and uh, um, thinking about emissions um, inventory. So um, we'll be advertising that one fairly shortly. And then at the end of the month on the 30th, we've got Paul Agnew from uh, the air quality uh, and composition team at the Met Office. He's going to talk about some of the Met Office air quality modelling developments. Um, so upcoming seminars to look forward to. Um, so thank you everybody for, for coming today. Thank you again to Alan and Kate for uh, the talks and hope to see you again at uh, the next one of our seminars.